everyone. Um, welcome to the Hingham School Committee meeting of January 23rd. I will call us to order and offer the following statement. This meeting is being offered remotely as an alternate means of public access pursuant to Chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022 and all other applicable laws temporarily amending certain provisions of the open meeting law. You are hereby advised this meeting and all communications during this meeting may be recorded by the Town of Hingham in accordance with open meeting law. If there are any participants who wish to record this meeting, please notify the chair at the start of the meeting in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 20F, so that the chair may inform other participants of said recording. We do have Harbor Media recording tonight. Um, I'm assuming we also are recording on Zoom. And anyone in the audience um, filming or recording? No, anyone else on the Zoom? All right. Um, just one thing, we're going to um, do a Approval of minutes, um, and then we are going to get the police report from Nathan um, Tesler because uh, there are midterms tomorrow <laughs> at Bingham High School. So we'd like him to be able to get back and get prepared for those. Um, so Nathan, we'll have you on in just a couple of minutes. Um, all right, minutes of the school committee meeting held January 9th. I will make a motion to approve the minutes of the school committee meeting held on January 9th, 2023. I will second. All right, any discussion? Yes. Yes. One thing. Um, Carrie made the motion to enter into executive session. It states Ness. So that was it. I can um, fix that easily. Anything else other than that change? All right. Um, most of, <laughs> do we do I want to amend the motion sure. to? Just um, I'll make a motion to approve the amended minutes of the school committee meeting held on January 9th, 2023. I have a second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, those are approved. Thank you. Um, all right, minutes of the budget session held January 12th. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of the school committee budget session two held on January 12th, 2023. I will second. Any discussion on those? All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, those are approved as well. And then the 18th, we're going to, we don't have those ready? Yep. All right, so we are going to past the 18th minutes of the 18th meeting. We'll get those at our next meeting. Um, with that, we'll move over to student communications. Uh, so I'll move very briefly, but um, anyways, we've had midterms the last several days. Um, so I will be um, leaving tonight because I got a three hour stat mid year tomorrow. So I got to study for that. But um, yeah, those are mostly done smoothly. But so since we have a school committee meeting um, with the school student advisory committee meeting on Wednesday, I'll save most of that news for then. Okay. So that is at 6 p.m. on Wednesday. Is that is that an open meeting or is that just? Um, it okay. is, yes. Yeah. So it's there'll be an open student. meeting with the student advisory committee and the school committee this Wednesday at 6. I'm excited for that. Yeah. And so, and then the additionally, business on that side, um, probably on some of the more budget meetings, I'll be sending Alex to um, kind of just watch them, view them just kind of gather some stuff about it. Just, I think the goal there is, as I said last time, is to try and familiarize some of us on the student advisory committee with the budget stuff in case we want to have a student speak at town meeting in support of it. I think that could be powerful in helping cast that budget because that will be a tough vote. Um, and then the only other thing I wanted to mention in my update was that the UVD week is coming up on February, week of February 6th. Um, it was a really great experience uh, last year. It's organized by our school's unity project, which is really focused on building uh, inclusion in our schools. I really enjoyed doing the open mic last year for that. Um, I did musical ad libs, so I kind of improvised something on the spot, didn't really prepare, and did like fill in the blanks. The audience had a great time, so they're doing that again. I'm really excited for that. Um, they're bringing back the student facilitation, um, which I got the email about. I don't think I'll be able to do it this year. But um, I'm sure that would be a great experience for the ninth grade students to get some um, coaching from some older students about, um, I don't know what the topic is this year, but it's, last year was kind of about, um, last year was kind of an inclusion topic, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and they're also adding a new uh, winter dance, which is exciting, exciting development. So that's what I had in my student update. And I'm gonna head out now, I'll see you guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> We will see you Thanks. on Wednesday. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Nathan. All right, um, we'll go back to our regularly scheduled agenda. Um, item three is questions and comments. 
Um, we encourage community engagement and welcome questions and comments as agenda items are discussed. Is there anybody in the audience or on Zoom who wants to bring something up at public comment, which is which are items not on tonight's agenda? I don't see anyone in the room. Anybody, can you see on Zoom? Uh, or, no, no hands. And no hands on Zoom. Okay, great. All right, well then we will move right into the superintendent's report. Um, so briefly, I shared um, first a uh, recruiting timeline for the executive director of student service. Says we're grateful for Dr. Venice and her years of service to the schools um, and her program um, and development of programs um, in our special ed program and in student services. Um, as you have heard, um, she's moving on um, to take another position at the end of the school year. Um, so we've already posted as of Friday um, the position um, and have started to recruit um, and we'll use social media and other forms to gather an applicant pool. Um, we'll be forming a committee, a screening committee um, that will consist of two staff members, teachers, two parent or slash caregivers, um, two students, a principal um, and a content curriculum director. So we're in the process of forming those committees and that screening committee and generating um, folks who might be interested and a school committee member, sorry, um, as well. Um, and working with the CPAC um, with this particular um, position to um, gather family, um, par parent and caregivers. Um, and then we'll follow the process and hope to have it completed by the end of March. Um, and you have a copy also of the job description. Um, we also are grateful for Ms. Roberts who served in the role of as interim um, assistant superintendent and we'll also have posted that position and are going through I shared previously the screening the screening timeline um, it'll have we'll have a screening committee that is very similar to parents care slash caregivers and we're working with the townwide PTO to recruit um, two staff members um, two students um, a school committee member a principal um, as well as um, a curriculum content director um, to serve on the screening committee and follow a similar process um, a reminder to the community, um, if you're not on the screening committee, there'll be an opportunity to meet the finalists um, and engage with them um, and ask questions um, and interact with them as we move through the process into March for both positions. Um, third, um, just to provide an update on the budget, we are um, meeting this Thursday at that meeting on Thursday at six o'clock. We'll be sharing with the school committee um, reductions that are part of the balanced redu reduced services budget. We learned um, and shared last week that we have a $7.5 million deficit with the town, um, of which the schools own 65%, which is a $4.8 million deficit for the school. On Thursday, we'll be sharing those reductions as well as hearing from athletics, um, transportation, <coughs> and facilities. Then on February 1st at 6 o'clock um, is another opportunity to discuss those reductions along with the school principals. On February 7th, we have a meeting, a joint meeting with the select board and the advisory committee to discuss the budget. And then the public hearing is at 6 on February 13th, um, the opportunity for the public to um, give input on what's been shared. A reminder to the community, we're sharing two budgets, that level service budget um, that provides um, for the current needs and helps sustain the current programming that we have and the balanced budget or the reduced service budget that includes those $4.8 million worth of reductions that um, we're, we'll share this Thursday. So there's a lot to stay attuned. Um, also on our web page, um, one of the big pictures, there's three big pictures going across. There's a picture that says budget. Um, if you press on that button, it'll take you to a brief overview of the difference between the level service and the balanced budget, a brief description um, of the deficit and the operational override and all of the dates. So we'll be adding to that particular page um, as we develop more information to share with the community um, moving forward. So it's, if you didn't catch any of those dates, go to the website. It's the first picture you see there, click on it and you'll see a listing of those dates and we'll try to keep that updated with new content. Okay, great, thank you. Um, any questions about the timeline um, for the two searches that will be going? Uh, well, it, 
you said that CPAC's helping out. Are they going to have mm -hmm. a, a, this CPAC going to have a representative on the search committee, or is that a, one of the two parent? We're asking their support and, and um, to help us um, nominate and identify those two parents. Okay. Okay. We'll do so through the CPAC. Okay. Um, if you if school so, and school, one school committee member on yep. each um, screening. So if you are interested in serving on those, I guess send me an email. Let me know, and then we can decide. Um, and if parents are interested or in serving on the committee, how are they? How do we? They no. should send an email to um, Susan D'Amato. Okay. Um, at um, and she will she's collecting the names and will work with the town wide PTO to filter through those names and identify some representatives. And we're sharing out that information. It'll be in principals newsletters and town wide PTO. The PTOs are sharing it through the, their newsletters. So we're hoping to share out that information over the next two weeks. Great. Thank you very much. All right, um, got the budget update. Um, number five is communications. Do you have any communications? All right, we did student communications already from Nathan. Any committee members have any communications to share? No? All right, um, six is unfinished business of which we have none. So we'll move on to item seven, 7.1, to receive the foster school improvement plan at long last. <laughs> <laughs> last but not last, least. Last certainly not least. The last well, for best. First, I want to say thank you um, for the opportunity to come see you and for your patience uh, when I couldn't be here a couple of weeks ago. So it's very much appreciated. Um, I'm very proud to be the new principal of Foster. I know it's weird to say new at this month. I think I'm six months in. Um, very happy to be here. I have an incredible uh, group of educators working with me and uh, parents, and it's a great council uh, to be a part of. So at Foster, our students will enjoy the process of learning, constantly striving to meet their potential and become lifelong learners, be responsible and will demonstrate respect for self, others, and property, practice critical thinking skills to solve problems, and have a strong sense of community both in and outside of school. And I think that last bullet is probably the one I'm most proud of. We've had a lot of opportunities to do things within the community uh, that uh, our student council has been a very big part of. So. Um, that's our mission statement. And oh, did I click the wrong thing? I have not had a mouse in my hand in a long time. I'm a touchpad guy, so bear with me. I just want to acknowledge that many of our school council are either in the room or they are on the Zoom this evening. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that my vice principal, Jen, is here. And uh, this was the one night Jen said, please, let's not make it be tonight, but it wound up being tonight. So I'm especially <laughs> appreciative of Jen uh, coming today and, and being here to, to uh, see the presentation. Um, it's been nice to have uh, a very active school council. Um, they have given me feedback along the way about some communication that needed to happen. And uh, Jen is always there to guide me in the history and helping me know all things Foster. So I thank all of them uh, for their hard work. So what was our starting point this year? So um, coming in, in in July of 22, um, I discovered that I have a very invested staff. Um, I set up lots of times for staff to come in and meet with me individually or as grade level. Uh, teams and I spent the month of July and into August getting to meet the different stakeholders that work within the school be it the uh, custodial staff or be it the paraprofessionals and then definitely we had a lot of grade level meetings where I got a sense for what direction the school needed to go so it was it was a nice for me to be able to get to know people and then really guide me in my journey here as the new principal I also want to acknowledge that there was a lot of parent and community support um, I'm very thankful for the PTO. Um, they did some nice videos of uh, me introducing myself, myself to the community, and uh, that was also another high point of the summer for me. I don't like being videoed, so that's not my favorite thing, but uh, it was well received, and then I even had students doing their own videos asking me questions, so it turned into a nice little summer activity. Um, we started the Hingham Tiered Systems of Support, MTSS, uh, if you're looking at the DESI webpage, but HTSS here in Hingham. Um, I would say to you as somebody who has implemented a uh, MTSS system, 
uh, in another district that uh, I was very pleased to come in and see the amount of staffing we had dedicated to uh, provide the interventions to the students. The other thing that uh, I came into was a framework for a schedule with half hour interventions, and I'm sure every principal has talked about that. I think um, one of the things I will say, I've had a lot of nice feedback from staff are that um, I was able to make the schedule so that none of the interventions overlapped. And that has allowed for a lot of attention to be put into areas where we needed some growth this year. So that schedule has absolutely been a cornerstone for getting the, some of the work that we needed done to occur. Um, communication, when I arrived, it seemed like there was a lot of concern around communication, especially with the potential for the building project. Um, I received parent concerns, I've had some staff concerns, and I think a lot of it had to do with multiple leaders within the last year. Um, so I, I think that was a common theme when I was meeting with the stakeholders last summer was they're looking forward to some stability and I'm trying my darndest to, to provide that to everybody and, and be a good communicator so people know what's going on. The other thing I think that we had that's a great launching point was our SEL toolbox, uh, Foster's Finest, which um, is our acknowledgement of students uh, who uh, exemplify uh, the characteristics we're looking for in school. Uh, we have our SEL curriculum, the toolbox, uh, the addition of the counselor. Uh, we are absolutely thrilled with our counselor. She's done a very nice job. And then uh, the recognition program we have every week for students. So those are nice starting points for us as we begin our journey here in 22-23. Uh, my opening theme with the staff this year was recapture the joy. Um, we spent a lot of time meeting and hearing from staff this, this summer, and, and I was looking for the right chord to hit as we began our year together. And um, the theme was ignore the noise, meaning the three years of COVID, the, the ups, the downs that came along with that, the lots of changes in leadership, and let's recapture the joy. Why did we become educators? What was it that made that spark that we all had at some point when we were beginning in our career? And, how do we recapture that for this school year? I think that was important for the foster community, especially after being separated into two buildings and you know that COVID journey was not fun. So I'm not saying it was fun for others either, but it, it was definitely not fun from everything I've heard. Um, oh, I wanted to go back. That picture was, um, how do I go backwards? Where is it? Second, the second one from the top. There we go, sorry about that. Uh, just to go back to this for one second. Um, so one of the things we did do, and we've had a couple of kind of themey things, the school council promoted a, uh, a winter wonderland uh, uh, theme for the bulletin boards at the school. Uh, when we hit Halloween, we did a, a staff choose your favorite book and dress up as a character from the book. Uh, it was well received, and I think we're going to bring it to the students next year and, and make that a theme around that time of year. But as you can see, the staff embraced Harry Potter, and we had themes amongst grade levels, which really made for a nice, enjoyable uh, Halloween. So, um, so here are our four goals. Uh, a lot of it had to do with the stakeholder feedback and conversations with school council and with uh, my meetings in the summer. So goal number one was to improve our communication which I think is proving to be vitally important as we're working on the building project. Uh, support Hingham tiered systems of support, improve our positive behavior support interventions, and then improve ISIT 504 and special education processes. So throughout the 22-24 school year, uh, I'm working on engaging in two-way communication. Uh, obviously, we're, we're do, using the S'mores program to do weekly newsletters. Uh, I have been holding parent coffees with me, uh, trying to do it bi-weekly, but some weeks are better than others, and I haven't quite hit that target yet, but we are having parent uh, coffees. It's been very helpful as far as um, identifying what the building project looks like. Uh, we've had new parents who are new to the district show up, and I'm able to explain what's been going on. It's been a very nice opportunity to meet with parents. Uh, I'm getting ready to launch the first survey to parents this, this coming February to see how people are feeling. Are there topics I'm not hitting that people would like to see in the newsletters? Um, and then engaging the community in the activities. Um, PTO is absolutely phenomenal. They're doing a lot. Um, the trunk or treat was fantastic and we've got some great plans coming forward. We're working on uh, trying to set up our um, because we don't have the space right now with the building project, our field day is our next 
project that we're looking at as to how do we make this happen uh, at the end of the year for everybody. So we're working on that. Uh, and then um, problem solving meetings with parents. Um, as you all know, we've been without, of a, with, with, blah, we've been without a playground uh, now for a few weeks. And um, there was a lot of concern around the loss of the playground and having students cooped up. Uh, we managed with the support of our facilities director um, and, so, um, and Officer McGillicuddy uh, to get some Jersey barriers up. And we've made a nice little play area in the front of the school. We've kept everybody safe and we're continuing to use that right now. I know tomorrow's building meeting, they're talking about can we use the, um, the sod has been put down on the, uh, on the new playground. So can we use the sod and stay away from the equipment so that we're back to having somewhat closer to a regular playground. Um, looking at the tiered systems of support, as I said, I started with the building schedule. Um, the feedback I have received from special ed, from the interventionists, is that this schedule is, is really helping them meet the needs of the school. Uh, I think today we had our first data meeting with the winter data, and there was some real positivity around some of the things that we were seeing, and it was nice to uh, see the fruits of their labor uh, coming to fruition. Um, so the schedule and then training staff. So we've, in coming to Hingham, um, we, we seem to have the, the staffing and the means to do tier two supports, um, but I think I needed to bring it back a step to tier one. So trying to overcome a culture of pull out servicing and doing more push in. Uh, I think there can be some uh, we talked about it at the last council meeting, some uh, misperceptions about what MTSS is or HTSS and, and uh, working to communicate that out to the constituents as well as working with the staff to really make it a model that, that occurs in the classroom and less outside of the classroom. Uh, we're starting, once the playground opens, I will have the capacity to do uh, PLCs. So we have uh, grade one is going to be our target grade to begin PLCs. Uh, working on making sure that they're very focused in strategic times, professional learning communities. I see some people go, what's a PLC? Um, so just to make sure that we have that professional time and it's planned and used effectively uh, when it comes to planning interventions and looking at data and, and working together to provide the best interventions we can, but also focusing back in on tier one, which you have to have that solid tier one in order to have a solid tier two. Um, Lesson studies, one of the things that I talked about when I was being interviewed was lesson studies, uh, were lesson studies. And we um, are hopefully going to have a lesson study uh, around the area of math where we're going to take some, it's, long story short, it's taking a lesson, working and creating it together, implementing it, debriefing, did it do what we wanted it to do, and then go back in and make changes and teach it again and see if the changes had the impact. It's a very community-oriented activity and it does build capacity amongst staff because they get to see things in action which is something that is very powerful when it comes to uh, teacher professional development uh, data meetings working with more ground level data um, so today was a perfect example of that uh, we we have begun looking at the iReady data um, seeing where we've been and where we are now and looking for that growth and making sure that we're hitting what we need to hit as far as targets go and then um, looking at year two, really starting to use PLC time next year to work on our interventions. So one of the positives that I talked about at the beginning was Foster's Finest. Um, we do have a system of recognizing students who are performing and they're doing the, the expected uh, behavioral things we do around school. Um, one of the things that I'm, whoops, I did it again. This guy is not supposed to have a mouse in his hand. Um, so when we're looking at um, Foster and thinking about what, a, what we can do to improve, one of my observations has been is that we all have our own way of getting students' attention for, per se. So sometimes I think that leads to confusion. I think if we can build a consistent system of what we're doing throughout the building with consistent expectations, it will help improve student behavior. Not that there's a crisis at Foster, but it's good practice, I think, for us to have consistent routines. So looking at uh, creating a matrix for what the expectations are, could be on the bus, could be on the playground, could be in the cafeteria, picking those target areas and creating what the expectations are as a staff 
and then getting it communicated out to students. The other component that I would like to have implemented by next year is having lessons that tie directly into the matrix. So if we're seeing, a, let's see, bus uh, X uh, may be having a lot of hot spots on it, so we can go back and during our morning meeting time really focus in on a targeted lesson that the staff has created to talk about behavioral expectations. Um, It'll be a lot easier when the new school is built, but I would love to start having whole school acknowledgement assemblies for the great work that, that the kids do. Uh, right now, we recognize kids with an announcement on a Friday. Um, what I would like to see is us having a whole school assembly where we're talking about what the theme is for the month, what the expectation that we're focused in on for that month, and really celebrate the, the, uh, the students who have succeeded in meeting that expectation. Uh, and then finally, uh, I'd like to have us have a script for some of those target areas so that when we're doing, and I say we, when Jen does the uh, announcements in the morning, um, you know, we have a, a set script tied to what the theme would be for the month so that we're really reinforcing those expectations as we move through the year. And then finally, um, the ISIT process. So, one of my personal goals in coming here was to try and be at every IEP meeting. That is a noble goal. It's one I'm not going to make. So I'm trying to keep that MTS 80, MTSS 80% 80 is, is the success number that I'm looking for right now for myself. Um, so I have been to many IEP meetings. I think it was important for me to be there to start to know the, the stakeholders in my school, the students, the families and um, to be able to give some feedback to staff as to how we can improve our meetings. Uh, I do love the format that Hingham has. I think it's a really strong format, um, but some of the work that I'm trying to do with staff is to get us a little bit more familiar with some of the ground level data that we talked about, say from iReady or Adibbles, and make sure that we're coming to our meetings with some fresh and current data, be it the ISIT, the 504, or the IEP meeting. Um, DCAP, we're working on the DCAP as a leadership team right now. Um, one of the things that I would like to see us doing more is using the DCAP when we're having an ISIT and trying to strategize as to what uh, we are going to do to help make that child successful. Um, and I think the DCAP, when we're done with that this year, will be nice to really incorporate that in the second year of our school improvement plan. Um, Again, going back to the expectations around data, making sure that we're using current data, giving feedback, and then reviewing our data quarterly to make sure that our students are, are coming through with an SGP of, of 50 or higher. Uh, 50 being smack dab, you know, it's a year's worth of growth. Um, we'd like to see it higher. And I can tell you one of the celebrations we had today in one of our data meetings was that we had some really super high growth numbers at, at the grade level meeting I was at this morning. So it was a time for celebration. So those are my four goals or our four goals, I should say. Um, I'm open for any questions if you have any. Thank you. Very good. Uh, yeah, no, I think this is great. Um, well done. Um, I guess one, it's kind of a minor thing, but just when when the plan is posted to the website, because it, it'll be publicly available, there are a lot of acronyms in here, and I think uh, parents won't necessarily know what they, right. what they mean. So if you wouldn't mind, like just kind of spelling them out, spelling it out. yeah, and putting Thank the you. that would be helpful. But yeah. but no, I think this is really exciting. So Thank great. You. No, it's a great suggestion. It's funny, when I started in education, I had just come out of the military and everything's acronyms in the military. And then, you know, here I am, well, I can't even believe it, 25, almost 30 years into this career and, and education has been, become much more acronym oriented in my uh, career. Great. Yeah, I know, I know. That's true. Uh, anything else? Uh, how are things with the construction? Feeling... If any of you want to come take I'll a view out the, the back, I'll bring you up to the second floor viewing deck. I did have a, a, a fourth grader walk by me the other day, and he said, I see you up here a lot, Mr. Shifley. It's hard to not watch what's going on. Um, it's coming along very well. The company that is working with us right now has been super fantastic, and, and pretty much other than the poor delay that they've had on the, the playground equipment, um, everything that they've said they were going to do has been delivered so far to my, you know, based on my observations. Uh, I do know some people are saying, why couldn't we have had this parking lot that they built in the front before? Because Foster has always been a little challenged around the parking. But um, the playground is literally just days away from opening. Um, once uh, I was told today that it appears the bolts arrived this afternoon. 
Um, so the, the equipment that was moved and saved will have some new hardware on it to make it up to code. And then, uh, you know, once it's inspected, we'll be able to open. The sod has been put down. Uh, about two thirds of the tennis courts that were there are now so it's a sodded field. Uh, I know Mr. D, our, our phys ed teacher, is really excited about that because he's trying to find the times when he can go out and use the sodded area for some of his PE classes. Um, and then they've got uh, the, we're waiting on a wall. They want, uh, they're putting up a wall to prevent balls from going into the marsh. And once that arrives, they'll put the basketball hoops up. But anything that they're going to do, I'm being told this morning, was going to be done on Saturdays so that it didn't interrupt our ability to use the, the new playground. So I think when that opens, there's going to be a lot of happy, you know, a lot of happy students. Nice. Good. And noise level? Noise level. I think it's more vibration level. Vibration level. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, once I'll say this once, I mean, the, the, you know, the shed, the, the, the shed came down on Friday, Friday morning. Yeah, it was Friday morning. The shed came down and, uh, you know, the kids were all up in the windows, like watching the shed come down. And fortunately it was right as they were coming into school. So, it, you know, they didn't lose instructional time. I think initially when they didn't have the new road built to get in and they were moving through the parking lot and, and out to the back, there was a lot of rumbling. Um, but right now, I think all of the work is being done out on the hill, and it, it seems to be a little bit quieter than I think anybody had anticipated. So it's more vibrations. <laughs> yeah. okay. oh, that's great. Good to hear. I think one of the things that's really important you can hear in um, the presentation by in the Foster School Improvement Plan is the connection to the strategic plan, mm -hmm. the staffing, and how it's supporting the implementation of MTSS supporting the needs of students, the use of data to make those decisions, um, as well as the components around social emotional learning, really using the guidance counselor and building a system that really supports the use of those resources. So I think it's a good example of how those resources are being deployed to really further um, and meet the needs of students, but also move the strategic planning that we've done um, further as well. And I think you could see that in several points, just those two really clearly um, in the presentation tonight. So it's those investments that have allowed the foster, that are going to allow the foster to continue to move forward in meeting students' needs. So I think that's important. Yeah, definitely. Well done. Michelle, Thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. I, so I wasn't going to say anything, but I, so I'm a parent of a foster uh, student. And I would, I would just say I've, as a parent, felt these changes. Um, the communication has been really strong. Uh, the IEP process has, has evolved just in this one, one short year. Um, so really, really excited with the work that you and the rest of the team have been, have been doing. It takes a team. <laughs> and, and I mean, I would say that that whole playground problem solving, that was awesome to see. That was, you know, you came out and said, uh, so, you know, sorry, we're going to have six weeks of, it's not the end of the world, but it's going to be six weeks where we got to be inside. And you heard feedback and, and worked with others to come up with a solution. And um, it's rare that you make everyone happy, but I, I think you actually made everyone happy. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think I made everybody feel hurt. I don't mean I think, you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we did have um, approximately eight parents who came to a special meeting just to help problem solve around the loss of the playground and what could we do differently. So that was very helpful for me. So, thank you. Thank you. The data, can I, I have a data review question that might be more of a Katie question, but I'm wondering if you do look at, do a close examination of data four times a year, you said, at quarterly. Uh, how does that work with the sort of district data review that happens three times a year? And I don't know how those schedules, how much the district review depends on the individual school's data review and how, like just how do those two systems work together? So specifically right now he's discussing the, um, the iReady is a middle of year. Um, so there's there's progress monitoring that goes on in between, but um, beginning of year, middle of year, end of year are the, are the three main data points um, for iReady. Uh -huh. um, there's other additional progress monitoring going on. And okay. so again, that um, end of February, um, annual presentation that we do with the middle of year uh, data will proceed as planned. But as Matt indicated, today was the first day of data meetings. Okay. And so the data is currently, um, it's been collected, yeah. it's currently being processed by the teams, and we'll pull together a presentation for end of February. Awesome. 
and then my my portion of when I was talking about quarterly, mm -hmm. for example, I'm I'm hopping on to iReady and I'm looking at usage mm -hmm. and I'm making sure if there's a like if I see a red flag of uh, somebody's not getting enough time and that practice that we're looking to get them to have during intervention times. Um, you know, I'm, I'm having conversations on a teacher principal level and making sure that we're using the right tool and we're doing it correctly. Awesome. Cool. Can I throw you a softball? Sure. You had said, I'd love the Foster's Finest yep. idea. Uh, and you said the kids are giving the uh, Foster's Finest award if, if they have the attributes of what makes a good foster community member. So they get I slips. Was, yeah. I was wondering if those, those characteristics, are they spelled out? Are they... The, the the big theme what, is what does out make a daily. good foster community member? Jen, you want to jump in on that? <laughs> <laughs> so around the edge of the Foster Science Award that was designed by Cynthia McKeon for us, it has um, all sorts of attributes, perseverance, many, many qualities like that around the edge. And then every morning I tell the children that they want to be stars. I'm on the spot. Mm -hmm. S is for safety, <laughs> try your best, A, always kind and are respectful. Mm -hmm. And I worked with a student today and we talked about how um, just one action can hit all four things, right? Yeah. So it, it works nicely. With the awesome. Kids. They look forward to it. They take their picture. Um, Matt sends it out in the newsletter each week. We try to, somebody's asked, we try to squeeze them in the picture. We, we get awesome. them in the next week. That's awesome. Yeah. Especially as you're going forward with PBIS, it's really important to really define those positive attributes Absolutely. we're looking for. Exactly. You know. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Oh, well, we're gonna we're gonna vote approve on your plan. Oh, we're, we're gonna pro approve your plan. Yes. yes. No, so <laughs> I'm gonna make a motion to approve. <laughs> Drum roll. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the 2022-2023 Foster Elementary School Improvement Plan. And I will second. All right. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All set. Thank, you, right. thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jen. Great work. All right. Um, item 7.2 is to receive the high school program of studies and act as appropriate. So I imagine Ms. Swanson is going to come up and walk us through. Yes. <laughs> I'd love to see it. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Hello. So I, I think everyone has had a chance to review the five-page memo that I, I sent to Dr. Adams and, and, and to, uh, to Katie as well mm -hmm. yes. that summarize all the significant, some more significant than others. I, I tried to err on the side of uh, letting you know if there was anything you should know. Some, some of the changes are, are somewhat cosmetic in terms of maybe renaming a course. Um, but some of them are, are more significant. So I'm not sure whether you'd like me to provide an oral summary of the uh, memo now, if that would be helpful, or just answer questions that, that you might have about it. Happy to, to do either. Uh, go ahead. Maybe we'll jump into questions and maybe that will, or do you want, would you prefer to hear a? It might be good for the public. Please. Yeah, yeah. my question was gonna be to, to explain yeah. Sure. So one specific area for, right. for the public. Okay. So should I go ahead and provide a quick overview of, uh, of the changes in general? So I'll, I won't go word for word through, through the memo since you probably already read it, but I'll highlight some of the key points. Uh, we'll go alphabetically through the departments. Um, first being art, really no fundamental changes in art, although we, we are proposing that we rename a couple of the courses. This was at the suggestion of the coordinator and each of the teachers in the department. In English, we see some more significant changes. The first is a new scheduling guideline that spells out uh, the expectation that any student who has not successfully completed their grade level English class not enroll in the next grade level English class until they have completed it. Obviously, that, that happens probably 95 percent plus well over 95 percent of, of students but in the event that something has caused a student to not complete their English class during the regular school year and uh, they are probably doing credit recovery over the summer we have on occasion uh, maybe a couple of students a year who don't complete the summer work they were supposed to and without the hard and fast rule or policy to to have as an extra incentive to complete that work on time. We've sometimes seen students 
enroll in their next level English class while they're still trying to finish the work of the previous one, usually with bad results. And, and so we're hopeful that this spelling out this expectation in the program of studies will be helpful in that regard uh, as an extra incentive for students to complete their work on time. The next change I think is an exciting one. It's a new course that emerges from, uh, from some, some of the terrific professional development work that one of our teachers, Jill Jope, has done, and it's a real passion for her. So she has proposed, and it's been successfully vetted by the English department, and then all of our department directors and coordinators, we go through a process with our school's curriculum council to review the new courses. All of us were excited about this one. It's called Disability Voices in Life and Literature, Reading and Writing for Justice. The full course description is here in the memo, and uh, it would it would replace a course that has been in our books for a long time called Modern Dilemmas. And we were joking about how the title Modern Dilemmas may not fit anymore because the course has been around for probably about two decades at this point. <laughs> Still a great course, and it has, it has been uh, popular over the years, but we have seen enrollment gradually declining in that course. So it's one of six senior English courses, um, not including uh, AP English literature that we offer to seniors, so really seven senior English courses. This would replace the lemmas with this new course. Uh, we're excited about that. I, I would note that uh, launching this new course would depend upon availability of um, funding for textbooks in it. Now, we've all got budget on our minds these days. We are proposing two new courses for next year, both of which would require the purchase of some new textbooks. And, so we're, we're hopeful that uh, the money would be available to purchase the, the text that would make those new courses <coughs> possible. Moving on to uh, the next department, industrial technology. Uh, the proposal is to rename several courses, but also to rename the department itself to move from industrial technology to technology engineering. And um, this reflects the evolution within the department. It also reflects a term that is uh, in more wide usage uh, in the field today at, at other schools, both the secondary and, and post-secondary level. So uh, it's, it's somewhat a cosmetic change, but then also a reflection of, of evolution there as well. Um, we're not exactly proposing a new course, but uh, we, we're proposing splitting the graphic design and photography one course into two separate courses, one that is entirely graphic design, the other that's entirely photography. There was consensus within that department that this would respond to student interest uh, and, and we think lead to greater enrollment probably in both of those courses. A uh, teacher was eager to make that change. The department as a whole felt like it would be a good change to make at this time as well. Uh, in physical education, uh, there's a proposal that, that is very significant. We did talk about it a couple of weeks ago uh, when, when we last talked. Maybe it wasn't even a couple of weeks ago, maybe a week and a half uh, ago when we met on the budget and we talked about the possibility of reduced staffing in physical education and how this could be linked to a proposal that we would have in uh, the program of studies that would reduce the number of in-school physical education courses that students would have to take. Um, and it's been for a long time that students at Hingham High were expected and required as a graduation requirement to take a semester of PE in school, both in ninth grade and in 10th grade. So we're proposing here that the in-school requirement would remain for grade nine, but not in grade 10. 10th graders could, of course, still elect to take phys ed in school, but could instead replace the course with an alternative um, in the same way that juniors or seniors do now. It could be participation in a school sport or it could be documenting hours in another approved activity. Uh, so we're proposing that change to, uh, to the graduation requirement as well. It would reduce the required grade 10 course, but still leave PE as an option for uh, sophomores as it has been for juniors and seniors all along. In science, uh, we're proposing another new course. Excited about this one. It's AP Environmental Science. It would be the first edition of a new AP course since the AP Research and Seminar courses that we added a couple years ago. We think this course would be very popular. It has proven popular at some other schools, uh, and, and we think it would be in our school as well. The addition of this course uh, would provide access to a new AP course 
And we think it's in some ways a more accessible AP science course than some of the other ones we've offered for a long time, AP biology, AP physics, AP chemistry. Um, and this will be open to students in grades 11 or 12. Also proposing a one credit summer option. We don't expect this would necessarily be big numbers, but would provide an opportunity for students. And we've had a number of students who have been involved in some of this kind of work over the past few years through the Cohasset Center for Student Coastal Research uh, and also the Weir River Watershed. Um, that it would be an opportunity for them to, to have this recognized on their, on their transcripts and also to earn uh, credit for that as well. And then finally, the last department, World Language, we're proposing a return to something actually that was done, as I understand it, 10 or more years ago, where introductory language courses in Latin and in Chinese, and I think I may not have spelled this out entirely in the memo, this is um, applicable to, to just those two courses, to Latin one and to Chinese one, which in recent years have been offered only at level three this would offer those course would offer students the chance to take those courses at either level two or level three so we think this would be an incentive for students who are high achievers and concerned about their gpas and in <clears throat> some cases there may be a disincentive to want to try a new language maybe uh, start latin or start chinese as a second language on their second um, or even third language there may be a disincentive to students who feel like, well, if I'm taking it at level three, even if I get an A, it could lower my GPA. So this offers students a chance to, to make a choice between level two and level three. We're also in world language, um, excited about piloting some dual enrollment through UMass Boston for our Latin four course. I know below that we, we're also looking at some additional opportunities in dual enrollment in some other areas as well. Uh, particularly math, social studies, and science. We're not as far along in the process there, so I'm not quite ready to see that in the program of studies at this point, but eager to explore those as well. Um, the other changes, there are just a couple here at the bottom. We added a description of our global citizenship program that, that has existed now for almost 10 years, but has not been spelled out previously in the program of studies that exists. It has a website and is a well-developed program, but we, we thought it deserved a place in the program of studies as well. We expect to similarly offer the new pathways programs in um, industrial technology and in the arts that we talked about uh, during our school improvement plan a couple of months ago now. Uh, we expect to, to add that to the program of studies next year. We're not quite ready to have all the language ready for the current program of studies, but we do think we'll be ready to pilot the program nevertheless in the next school year. There were a couple of other minor changes. Uh, we noticed that we had not uh, spelled out the two and a half credits in health in the program of studies. It's in the student handbook. It should be in the program of studies as well. So we're adding that, reducing the credits in PE from five to 2.5. And, um, and I think that's it. I think that's it. So um, happy to take any questions on, on any of that that you might have. I just, Go ahead. I just had one on the, um, the, lang the introductory language courses. You said there'd be a level two and a level three. Who would decide which level a student would go into and how would that decision be made? If, they're, they're, if they were also taking another language, it could be um, a recommendation from their current language teacher, but in, in most cases it would be the, the choice of the student. And if they disagreed, if they had a teacher recommendation and disagreed with it, uh, there's an override process to, okay. to go up a level. But um, in almost every case, I think it would be at the discretion of the student and the family. Okay. Thanks. Um, I had one question, one comment. Um, my first question is for the students who choose to not take gym in 10th grade, mm -hmm. um, how will that, and they choose to take a, a, another half year course, will they, or they will be replacing it with, right. how will the enrollment be impacted by that in, the, in those classes there? Do you see room in a lot of those other classes? Will they, will kids likely get their first or second choice? Is it, how do you? I, I think the, the change could in some ways, um, rep, it could lead to some gains in enrollment in other elective areas. I, I would expect that we will see uh, bigger class sizes, <coughs> with, um, numbers that we can handle in places like our music electives. 
um, including band, orchestra, chorus, uh, some of the other music electives within the art program as well, particularly in places like graphic design, photography, uh, in the industrial arts, uh, in our family consumer science classes. There are some sections that are pretty close to full, but there are others that clearly have room. And I know there are students who would like to have the opportunity to take them. And uh, particularly for students, I think, in, in special education who've got a period in their schedule that, that is blocked up by a strategies for learning class, and it leaves a little bit less flexibility in their schedule to now have an additional place where if they really had an interest in pursuing another class in one of those other areas, they'll have a chance to do that now. Um, I also would anticipate that a decent number of sophomores may want to stay with PE. It could be with a regular PE course, or it could be with the course that we piloted this year, uh, the Introduction to Yoga class that is currently taught by Ms. Papuga, who happens to be a, an art teacher, very popular art teacher, but is also certified as a yoga instructor. So she's kind of crossing department boundaries in a way and offering this course. It, it was her idea in the first place and, and um, recommending that course a year ago when we added it. It's been popular this year in its first year. Um, Ms. Shinny, one of our PE teachers, also could theoretically teach that course as well. So if we saw the numbers in Introduction to Yoga increase, that'd be another way for students to meet the PE requirement, even if they're not playing a school sport. And I, I would expect that we'll see the numbers grow probably in that area as well. Thanks. And my other, I just had a comment that I'm very happy with the world language change for the Latin Chinese. I have two Latin students at home. Um, I mean, it won't impact them, but uh, I think I think it's a great idea. Great, thank you. The the Latin class has been incredibly popular and increasingly so in recent years. We've seen um, really that program has has been very robust and increasingly popular. The teachers are doing a great job with it, and uh, this may be an extra reason for students, even if they're already taking Chinese or or French or Spanish, to try out Latin and add that as an additional language. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have and more just have comments. Um, the yoga has gone uh, over really well, I think, especially with the social emotional well-being of the kids. The Shavasana is <laughs> my daughter's favorite pose. Um, so she gets to relax <laughs> for a little bit. So I'm a little jealous of that. Um, but I'm really excited about this um, senior seminar, the disability. Um, it makes me want to go back to high school because to, to learn about ableism and what that really means, I think, is really powerful. So thank you for bringing this. It's been a pleasure, and kudos to Jill Job for, for her work in introducing that course. That, um, that's really been a passion for her. She's done a lot of her own research and uh, professional development work in that area, and I think that class will, uh, will prove to be a great one. We've seen excellent additions in, in English in recent years. Two years ago, we added Reading to Write. Zach Raymond teaches that course. And uh, a couple of years before that, we added Global Issues in Literature. That was Kara Roth's um, passion project as well. Both of those have almost immediately become staples of our English department. I have a feeling this one will too. Good. Thank you. Allie? Um, I just wanted to echo what everyone else said, but also in terms of the gym, we've talked about it before, but I'm really excited because not only students in special education, but the music students who don't have a chance for other electives, that will open up some options for them, even if they take the yoga class or one of the other phys ed classes. I think it's nice just all to have some alternatives for them. Um, and same with the English, the seminars. I love the new additions and it's nice for the student who doesn't want a traditional English lit class to have some other options. So thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I would just, my comments would be, I think this is um, really well done and very thoughtful approach. I think it really pulls in so many of the things that we've been wanting to have, right, between the strategic plan. Um, I think it really increases access for students and the AP offerings, the leveling of the world language, the Chinese and um, Latin. I think the disability um, voices is an amazing addition to this. I think just the GCP explaining that a little bit more. Um, my son loved that program. Um, and just explaining to bring pull more kids into that. I think this really sort of encapsulates sort of a lot of the things that we've been wanting for the district. Um, I know some of this is tied to the budget. So I am really, this is just another example of why we need to get this override pass to fund these things. I mean, the 
this is great work being done at the high school and we really we have to find a way to fund this work because it's an incredible amount of thought and effort went into this between your team and the um, staff in the building so i really do hope that we can see these all come to fruition because this is great stuff thank you michelle appreciate that very it's okay. Much. Rick, would you describe what dual enrollment means? Um, folks might not know what that means and why go, move forward with dual enrollment oh, in some courses. Sure. Um, dual enrollment, uh, in, in a way, there's some similarities to taking an AP course where it gives the students an opportunity to earn college, college credit for work that they're doing in high school. So um, it, it requires a partnership with a university and, and requires approval of uh, the, the teacher's credential and the syllabus, the course syllabus from the university. So we'd need to ensure alignment and consistency between our course syllabus and, and what the college is offering. In this case, it's UMass Boston uh, with their Latin course. And um, unlike AP, it does not require an exam that's been designed by the college board at the end of the year. It just requires passing the course. The specific requirements might vary a little bit from one university to the next in terms of the, the expectation, uh, but generally there's an expectation a student would have a, would have a, a GPA that meets the requirement when they first enroll, and they, uh, they meet a certain benchmark academically in the course. Um, you know, generally uh, you know, like a, a B or higher in the course and they would just pay a fee for the credits and the credit, the college credits would be awarded by the university, in this case, um, UMass Boston. So an opportunity for students to show they're capable of doing college level work while they're in high school, it's a, it's a terrific boost for the student. Uh, and on, then also potentially uh, significant financial savings for them down the road as well. Thank you. Um, is there anyone online who has any questions? Or Tim? Yeah. Uh, have we thought about the policy? I know I've heard a lot of parents complaining about the AP students requiring to take the AP exams. Uh, it seems to limit the students that would, be, that would be taking AP classes. I don't know if that's a policy that you, people have thought about over the years. I know if, I don't want to turn over, you know, well, debates right. that have already been settled, but... It's, I'm surprised to hear that you that you have heard complaints because they I, they haven't been complaining to me about okay. that. Um, so I I haven't heard much pushback about okay. that. I, I do know that it's it's very much the norm at high schools okay. now. I, I've, it's going back quite a few years now because I've been in Hingham for 16 years. But I've worked at two other schools on the South Shore previously where the policy was identical. There's an expectation re related to the debates that are had about uh, special ed kids and students in AP classes. Yeah. Uh, so it's all sort of part of that similar debate, wondering if there'd be more opportunities for special ed kids to take AP classes if the re exams weren't required. I, I'm not sure. I'd be interested in hearing more if, if okay. people really feel that way. That I, I, have not, I have not sensed that previously, but I wouldn't rule out any discussion, okay. uh, particularly around the areas of improving access mm -hmm. and encouraging uh, more special ed students to consider work in AP courses. I think it is important to remember that you, you can be enrolled in the AP course, take the exam, but you don't necessarily have to report those scores. Okay. So you can have the opportunity to sit for a rigorous exam and do the best you can okay. and decide then when you get those scores not to share them. Okay. Um, so I, I think I didn't think about that before. Yeah. Thanks. So I think it's just an opportunity to sit through a rigorous exam that you might at a college, mm -hmm. even if you might not get a very high score. And I think we saw a bit of that in some uh, AP courses where the scores were not as high mm -hmm. because the, the, the program in that particular content area had made a decision to, to cast a wider net and, and really make the course more accessible and open to others. So awesome. I, I think that's another way to look at it. Okay. It's just an opportunity to, to get ready, engage, um, and try out what it would feel like. Um, and maybe not report that score. Great. 
I, I, I will say too, the dual enrollment is an exciting um, angle as well to explore um, expanding the net of um, students accessing college level work. And um, the dual enrollment will be a bit more proficiency based um, rather than a high stakes test at the end. So uh, we are in early stages of exploration and more to come on that. But um, to give you an example, we were in recent discussions with Quincy College. Um, they have um, a, a really robust dual enrollment program. Many um, area schools have that dual enrollment. And um, I do think that'll be another avenue to explore um, to expand our net of providing college level coursework to students. So awesome. more to come. For dual enrollment, we're, we're, those are taught in Hingham schools by Hingham teachers. <clears throat> taught in, okay. in Hingham schools by Hingham um, teachers. I know different places have dual enrollment programs, but the kids go to the college and take a course. Correct. And, no, this, okay. is, this is here on campus. Um, okay. So again, the meeting was just on Monday. So we are very early in the conversation. And again, um, many more conversations awesome. to be um, had around it. But I do think that's an exciting very high avenue in that. to explore. Yes. <laughs> There's no one online. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Thank you, Carrie. Great. Great points, and I would just add one addition to Margaret's point about AP2, that the score in the AP exams are not factored into the Hingham High School grade mm -hmm. either. Um, uh, and, and so I think that's an important point, but um, I also was very excited about the meeting recently with Quincy College, and that they've already established a uh, relationship with a number of other South Shore schools, a couple of others that are in their first year with them, and. Mm -hmm. um, have reported a good experience in the early going. Marshfield is in his first year, for example, and I spoke with their principal about it a couple of weeks ago. He's been pleased with it so far. They're piloting three courses. And um, the chance to do it right, you know, right at your own high school. I would expect that next year that that dual enrollment through UMass Boston will be probably happening in room 172 at Hingham High School during whatever period it happens to be with most likely Justin Minahane teaching the Latin four class that he would have been teaching anyways but students having that opportunity to earn college credits while they're doing it. And just Exciting a, development. On a quick glance at a few of the syllabi that I was reviewing, um, they're nearly identical to okay. some of our senior electives. Um, so really it wouldn't be um, yeah. a very heavy lift. The rigor of our senior electives is such that it very much would meet um, college, college awesome. level. And one more really nitpicky question. With the field, summer field studies, who supervises those and do they need to be stipend? I think it will most likely be the department director. Okay. Katie probably has, I actually, uh, or maybe she will. <laughs> I may or may not have started this one. So this okay. has been on, on, ongoing for a, a few years now. So we do have a partnership with the Cohasset Center for Student Coastal Research. And so many of our students in environmental science, botany classes and so on, oceanography mm -hmm. classes, um, it's been um, a way for them to extend um, their interest mm -hmm. into the summer. Um, so they will begin um, some field studies around campus that they can then um, continue. We did recently receive receive um, about a year and a half ago a grant with uh, NOAA is a partnership of area South Shore districts that we're all together trying to expand um, opportunities for students to participate in field work. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that will be um, overseen by um, the science director. So Michelle Romano is um, leading that work this okay. year. And through that, um, Cohasset Center for Coastal Research is kind of the hub, but we're then partnering with other watershed organizations, including Weir River, North River Watershed, and so on, um, to participate in various okay. projects that are ongoing, kind of all around the, the theme of uh, citizen science. Awesome. They sound awesome. It's, yeah. it's I, been, I want to it's do been one. a great partnership. <laughs> great partnership. But it is the, just to clarify, it's the department heads who would be supervising Correct. The organizations that are supervising the work that the kid is doing. And in, in charge of the credentialing uh, okay. of that, reviewing um, the science journals and so on. I um, historically would have the students actually do um, a small presentation at our science department oh. meetings as part of their kind of capstone um, yeah. experience to give them that. that experience of um, presenting at a scientific uh, conference. So Awesome. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you yeah. very much. All right, um, if there's no other questions, we'll I'll make a motion on this. Right. to approve the proposed Hingham High School Program of Studies for 2022, no, 2023-2024. <laughs> I will second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank, you Thank, so you so Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm on Zoom. All right, um, item 7.3 is to receive the Middle School Program of Studies and act as appropriate. Hello, Mr. Smith. Good evening. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Yes. 
and just to echo the sentiments of the committee, if I ever make it out of middle school, I'd like to be a student at Tingham High School based on some of the things. <laughs> keep trying every year. Yeah, I keep trying, Tim, but you know, I've been stuck there for about 20 years now. Um, we have a few changes to the middle school program of studies, nothing as extensive as the high school, certainly, but still important to us that I'd like to review with you. So I'll just take them department by department. Uh, first, we are looking at some language in our English department that would allow for us to combine instructional levels in grades seven and eight. Currently, um, we have three instructional levels for English in grades seven and eight, uh, advanced, upper standard, and standard. This would allow us to combine levels of students um, as needed. The students would still be recommended for an instructional level, but they would be instructed as a mixed group um, in the English class with appropriate assignments and assessments uh, differentiated based on their individual needs. So that gives us a greater deal of flexibility in creating schedules and also um, helps to address some of the smaller um, enrollments that we have in some of those English cohorts. Uh, similarly, in art, we would like to um, see language in there that would allow us to combine our grade seven and grade art classes into a multi-grade classroom um, if the enrollment should um, support that need. Right now, we're looking at some smaller enrollments in our art classes. This would be a 7-8 art program that would have a rotating two-year curriculum, so the projects would be different year to year. Again, um, it would address some of our smaller enrollments that we've seen post-pandemic in our art classes, um, but also it gives us a greater degree of flexibility in creating student schedules, and we would have more places to plug in a class like art for students who have other elements in their schedule that are a little bit more restrictive, whether it be uh, that they're music students and they have to be in those, those prescribed music classes at the beginning or end of the day, or if they're receiving special education support that takes up a block of their day. This gives us uh, more opportunities throughout the day and it's not restricted to the grade seven or grade eight art class. In mathematics, a few uh, minor changes. We are gonna take our math eight and math eight with algebra, combine those two. Both of those are upper standard classes. We're gonna bring those back together into a course that will be titled math eight, but have elements of both of those curriculums. It's kind of a throwback to how we did it many years ago, where we, before we separated out math eight and math eight with algebra into two separate uh, instructional courses, um, it, it still would follow the state frameworks and guidelines and students would be uh, covering all the appropriate material, um, but we just feel that we would be better able to meet the needs of the students by combining those two courses into one. And just a naming uh, consistency, we have had math prep for grade seven and eight students for many, many years. And for the past few years, we've had a course called Math Lab for grade six. It's essentially the same type of instruction. It's math support classes for students. Um, we're just gonna call them all Math Labs from now on rather than Math Prep. We felt that it was more accurate description of what was going on with our students and it would avoid confusion between the different grade levels. And finally, similar to our art change that we're proposing in music, we are proposing that we have the ability uh, with language in the program of studies to combine our grade seven concert band class with our grade eight concert band class. We've seen declining enrollment again post pandemic. I think the students were not very enthusiastic about performing by themselves at home. And so we are still building those numbers back. And I do think within a few years, we'll see the numbers that we saw um, before for the pandemic, but right now we're seeing smaller um, than traditional class sizes in, in the music program. This would address a few things. First of all, if you're gonna be performing in a band, you need a band, right? You need a few more than four or five kids in a room to really get the sound that you want to achieve. Um, but also, again, it gives us that flexibility in scheduling for students who have more restrictive elements in their schedule. 
Again, we would work to look at a rotating curriculum if we were to do this. And again, it's going to be based on uh, enrollment data that we'll collect throughout the year. So we're allowing ourselves the opportunity to make these changes, not necessarily saying we're definitely going to do it. We're having language in there that gives us kind of that, uh, that caveat that if need be, we can do it. Um, we did have some experience in this um, during uh, hybrid learning. When the students came back, we had to combine all of our seventh and eighth grade uh, band students. Um, it, you know, not only were they combined into a multi-grade classroom, it was a very large cohort, and they were outside in a tent being instructed by Mr. Sincata. And um, not only did they meet that challenge, they, they thrived. Our eighth grade students took on leadership roles with our seventh grade students, and that was all done you know, with very little notice. This gives us the, the opportunity to look at the course of instruction and make decisions based on um, where we see students in grade seven and eight currently and come up with pieces that are appropriate for their playing ability and instructional level. Um, and that, those are the changes that the middle school is proposing in a nutshell. So I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Oh, great, thank you. Go ahead, Jen. <laughs> um, I'm assuming that when you say that because you have the rotating projects in art and I'm thinking for the current seventh graders, does that mean that they will be able to take it next year too? The same for music or is it? Correct. You can't, you can take it two years. So yes, you can, okay. you will be able to take art and music in grade seven and eight. It would be similar to our health curriculum, which is on a rotating basis. All of our seventh and eighth grade students take health, but it's, it's a, it's one curriculum for seventh and eighth grade students. It's a multi-grade class and that rotates year to year. So the topics covered uh, this year will be different than the topics covered next year. So seventh and eighth graders can both sit for the same class two years consecutively and not cover the same material. Great. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Allie? I just had a question on the English. Maybe you can speak to, I know during the pandemic that the teachers did have the classes, they were not leveled, so they have experience with this. Mm -hmm. and clearly they were quite capable of managing multiple levels at once. But as we're also talking about reductions in budget and one of the middle school um, efficiencies with the English teacher that's not being replaced, how, how do you see that being impacted if we have to increase numbers in those classes and a teacher trying to manage multiple levels? Great question. Um, so currently, we do follow this model in science and social studies. We have our standard level students who are folded into our upper standard classes. We, we allow us that, that ability. The language has existed for quite a while, and it's been quite successful. Um, what we would make sure that we do is provide the appropriate supports based on our existing personnel for students students based on their academic needs. So we wouldn't simply create a class of 25 students, um, you know, pulling kids from here, there, and everywhere. If we had a cohort of students who might be recommended for a standard level class, we could incorporate those into a smaller group of upper standard students with the appropriate supports in place so that they have either a special educator or a paraeducator, whatever the IEP services would dictate in that instance. And again, the instruction would be differentiated within the confines of one section. Thank you. You're very welcome. And just to get even more granular with sure. Ali's question, I'm wondering if uh, I mean, look, there's, so what we're talking about is a classroom with different levels of kids in it, and those different cohorts of kids in the same classroom would have different expectations in the class. Correct. That puts a lot more prep work and other things. I'm, I'm just wondering, at what level does it become a change of working condition that needs to be negotiated with the HEA? Uh, that's a good question. It had not been considered a change in working condition previously okay. when we made that change in science and social studies. Um, and therefore, it is similar to the instructional approach taken in our sixth grade classes currently, which are heterogeneous. Okay. And we have students of multiple academic abilities all in one cohort. So differentiation of instruction is not so much a change in working conditions, right. but what we would all call good teaching. Right. I. I'm just thinking in, this, in the same class, <laughs> yes. not, yep. we're talking, I mean, it seems that you're talking about, you know, different assessments and different, that's. Mm -hmm. And it, that, that's currently happening in okay. science and social studies. And yes, yes, it w there would be, uh, you know, a bit of, of a learning curve initially. And if, you know, if we needed to provide 
time during the school day for teachers to collaborate um, as we move forward. We certainly could do that as and we've no, done in other areas. Okay. I think it also awesome. allows us to balance class sizes yeah, because definitely. we had some very small class sizes and some larger mm -hmm. ones. So this allows the, the middle school flexibility to really schedule out kids according to needs and balance out the class sizes um, a little more. Instead of yeah. having a smaller um, class in one level, um, now we can spread it out, as has been done in science yeah. and social studies. Um, Absolutely. Allows... I, I think it's a great... I don't have any concerns about doing it. I oh, just no, want to no, make I... sure that we're... You know, you know better than I do to talk to the teachers, make sure we're not just heaping work on them. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, no, it, it's Without, certainly yeah. it is certainly going to be um, you know, a bit of a learning curve, as mm -hmm. I said, but we will make sure that we give the teachers the tools, resources, and time in order for it to be successful. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Matt, sorry. Yep, sorry. Just to sure. uh, same uh, topic. So the leveling. Um, when you explained the, uh, when you answered in the gallery's question, it was around standard being an upper standard. But I'm mm -hmm. understanding it could be, that was an example. It could mm -hmm. be at all levels. You could have upper standard. Sure. And yes, we have had in both science and social studies yeah. where the language has existed, we've had students who had been recommended for an upper standard class. Um, included into an advanced level class and the assignments and assessments are our upper standard level assignments and assessments but they are included in the advanced section sometimes that's based on uh, just the need because we could not fit this the student into the proper place in their schedule because of all of the other parameters that we needed to meet but in other cases it's a student who um you know for a variety of reasons we felt would would do well with students in the advanced section and um, while they weren't ready for the rigor of the advanced work, um, the environment was the appropriate place for them. So we do have that. It, I use the upper standard and standard example because that is the most common yeah. example that we will find as this plays out. But it doesn't say, the language does not exclude other, other scenarios, but with multi-levels. So, okay, th that's helpful. Um, I guess I'll just say out loud, this makes me a little nervous. I don't know enough about is, if this is a huge change or not a change. I just, I'm thinking about the public and I know Dr. Adams, when you came in, there was definitely some concern around, are we going to be eliminating leveling? And so I, I, I you know, again, this might be a minor change that's gonna impact, you know, a few kids and it might be the right answer. We do it in science and social studies, I guess. I'll just say I'm, I'm personally like without understanding this better like a little nervous about that specific change i think you have to remember scheduling wise we have some very small classes yep. that and then we have some larger classes so by being we're not getting rid of leveling we're just allowing um, two levels to exist in a class which exists all the way up through high school right. you have classes that are multi-level all the way up through grade 12 already um, this just allows it in English as well in the middle school so that we don't have very small classes and very small classes often that are majority special education. This allows us to be able to not have classes that are over 50% special education in some cases um, so that we can um, provide for um, the better scheduling wise and more places to schedule the students, which also then allows us more opportunities to make sure that they have opportunities for electives, especially for our special education. It opens up the, the schedule for um, all of the students, including our students with special needs, whose schedules are more narrowly defined by making sure they get their services. Um, so that's what it does, um, as we've been doing in science and social studies. So it keeps the leveling, but allows the flexibility in the schedule. Do you want to add anything else? No, I think you, you summed it up nicely. I mean, it, it it is not the same as during the pandemic and during remote learning where we said we were doing away with levels. This is the combining of leveled instruction within a classroom. It's 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 expanding our, our differentiation of instruction. So students will still be recommended for a level of instruction. And if we find that this this 
is necessary, we have the language available to us that, that supports the decision to be made going forward in moving our students into a, a classroom where there are multiple levels of instruction occurring simultaneously. So why would, why, so that makes sense. I can understand the benefits. Why just English in seventh and eighth grade? Why not, why not do it in math? Why not do it in, I, I'm not suggesting we should do this, but I'm curious, like we're, we already, do it in science. we already do it in oh, science. Know, why, we already do it in why social not math, studies. Why not high school? The scope and sequence of mathematics instruction um, is one of the last hurdles to to overcome. You can't. It's much more difficult to have multiple levels of instruction in a mathematics course because if you haven't mastered this concept at this point, you're not ready for the next one. So the the challenges of that differentiated instruction in the mathematics course are much greater than, than we're ready to tackle at this time. And it's differentiated by content, right? Correct. So there's a math seven, eight pathway, and then there's the math, and I'm getting the titles wrong. There's one where eighth grade, you're taking algebra one. So there's a, there, it's already differentiated by the two paths that they go through, right? It's you math are seven and eight, and then math seven and eight combined, and then there's an algebra one. Chart. Yes, and, and you can move between the, the, the various levels year to year. So it's not as though you are predestined to take one certain course of instruction in mathematics, but it, they do lend themselves to a certain sequence of instruction. And there's more, there's more levels in math isn't there? You have or is it the college level. Remember they, they added the. Yes, the and, and one of the one of the earlier changes that I mentioned was the combining of math eight and math eight with algebra okay. into one course called math eight. So we're we're those are both upper standard level classes. So we are we are taking away one of those courses, but no, I shouldn't say taking so we away. We're combining them. Well, I don't want to say three. So we we're going back to three, or are we still leaving? Grade eight, we'll be looking four. at three levels of instruction. Okay. Yes. Okay. Just saying, because it's getting a little jumbled in my mind. Yeah, so it's probably getting right. jumbled in sure. other people's minds. Differentiating between uh, having different cohorts in a class and having an inclusion class. Uh, so every single school, every single classroom in Hingham has a diverse group of learners Correct. Uh, with different needs, with different levels, with different, you will never have a cohort in a class who are all exactly the same level. Absolutely. So that's not, that's not what we're talking about. I'm talking, I think we're talking more about having a class that's divided into these, um, the teachers preparing this half of the class for this test and this half of the class for this test is slightly different, but it's getting all mushed up, so. Yes, except that those courses of instruction have already existed. Exactly. So, so they don't have to recreate the wheel, yeah. right? So, so a teacher who will have um, standard level students in an upper standard class, to go back to that example, has most likely already taught this upper yes. standard and standard level. So the materials exist, the, the, and they're just bringing the two cohorts together at one. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Allie? Um, I just wanted to add to I I really like how you're combining for art and music and the electives the seventh and eighth grade students because I think one of the things that middle school does a really great job with when students come in in the sixth grade is separating them a little bit from the older students but as they get to seventh and eighth there's not um, the students can take similar classes but they don't often have opportunities to be with the other grades so it's kind of a nice way for them to actually meet some other students and see some of the older kids and get to know them definitely definitely so i think that's and, a really positive and, and our eighth graders can take on a bit more of a uh, leadership yeah. role in some of those classes mm -hmm. and it, i think it will strengthen our sense of community rather than have a section into grade levels so. and i know with the band and orchestra one of the challenges was you need certain instruments to play and if there's not enough students, it makes it really hard to learn. Absolutely. So that's a, a nice change for them while it's smaller and, numbers. And those connections will help with the transition to high school too, because you're going to a new school where you already know some people. Definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions on the, no, on the public art? Um, yeah, I'd like to just comment that I appreciate this flexibility that you're building in, I think, for the, in the in into the schedules. I think it does enhance particularly the electives at once again sort of what's um happening at the high school as well and i think this these changes are not significant they're a big change in english i guess but it's being done in the other in some of the other disciplines and i think this is a way to enhance the learning environment for all the students and i think just this is 
a great example of a school proactively looking at enrollment and being flexible to in, improve our budgeting and helping us get through this tough time, right? You're finding some efficiencies here. I think sometimes the schools are often criticized for just, oh, you're just always adding things, but it's not what you did here, right? You found some ways to make efficiencies in the schedule that will not only help students, but also helps create some room in the budget to um, to improve learning for students. So I think this was these were some great ideas. Thank you. Well, that I will make a motion to approve the proposed Hingham Middle School Program of Studies for 2023-2024. I will second. Right. Any further discussion? All right. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstain? I'm going to oppose. I'm just, I'm just, I'm not ready on the, myself, so I know it's going to happen, but I hear all the pros for the, the English language, but yeah. Yeah. No problem. Very good. All right. Thank you. You're Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. Um, item 7.4 is to accept a grant from Next Generation Learning Challenges. Sure, absolutely. So um, to continue on with the theme of innovation, um, we had recently applied for a grant from Next Generation Learning Challenges, uh, which uh, allows districts to um, do site visits to districts that are considered innovative in various ways. And so uh, we've assembled a team of five educators from Hingham High um, who will be heading to Casco Bay in Maine um, to a small, um, a, a small urban school that has done some really interesting work in the space of innovation um, by um, in integrating experiential learning um, by integrating advisories, by integrating uh, standards-based grading, um, and um, in general, um, they have um, just a really interesting model. And so this um, uh, leverages not only um, pathways, which is um, a, an avenue that we hope to explore further, um, th and because this is a great uh, model that they are a few years ahead of us on. Um, also, um, it gives us a chance really just to leave our zip code, see what else is going on um, in the world, and so so um, we'll allow the team to research and, and do some visioning. And so I do anticipate that some of what we um, discover and explore during the site visit might appear in our program of studies next year. So again, just kind of laying uh, the groundwork for some of that research and development and um, kind of poking our heads out of the sand, leaving the zip code and uh, seeing what's out there. So the team um, that we have assembled um, really has been strategic in that we know that we're um, exploring pathways in um, the newly named technology engineering department, formerly known as industrial technology, and also the fine arts. And so we'll be joined by our fine arts director by one of our um, technology and engineering slash industrial technology teachers. Um, uh, we will have a member of the, for, uh, the World Language Department, um, given that they are already um, have the uh, Global Citizens Pathway. And I'm missing one person. Who am I missing? We have, um, oh, myself. Yeah. That's a <laughs> That's a yes. So uh, there'll be a team of five. And Erica Pollard has volunteered to be an alternate um, should one of the members of our team drop out and or if one of the other members from other districts, so there'll be um, six districts uh, convening in Casco Bay uh, for this experience. And so Erica will join if there is um, a dropout. So, um, so the funding will provide um, uh, not only substitute coverage, um, reimburse the, the district for the subs that are incurred, um, and also cover all travel um, expenses up to 750 per participant. So, um, so if five of us attend, um, it will be uh, 3750 if all six of us end up attending, it'll be a grant of 4,500. That sounds great. Thank you. Um, any questions about this? Just, right. just one. So, do the grant? Will the grants cover all of the costs of this? I think it sounds fantastic. Yes, I, I think yeah. it's very likely, given that we are so close by. So, um, so this is a, a national grant. So, um, the other option was, in fact, um, went on the West Coast, <laughs> and so that might be a, a next year future um, a, a grant that we would apply for. Um, but in the short term, this is this is close to home, and so they already cover the hotels, some of the meals, and so this um, would primarily be covering the sub um, sub costs and would be covering any um, road travel incidents incidentals and so on so great thanks yeah. thank you any other questions 
Any other questions? All right. Great. Worked with the Bar Foundation before. They're good people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you want to make a motion? Yeah. I'll make a motion to accept the grant of up to $4,500 provided by Next Generation Learning Challenges with funding from the Bar Foundation for the purpose of funding a team of Hingham Public School educators to explore innovative pathways at Casco Bay High School in Portland, Maine. I will second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstain? Great. Oh, all right. Um, 7.5. Jen, are you going to take us through this sure. uh, right. second read of our comfort dog memorandum of understanding and sure. act if people are ready. Yeah, I think we um, covered most of this at our last meeting. Um, but this, this is just a second read to go over the two changes that we had um, on the letter agreement with the Hang On Police Department for the comfort animals and Hang On Public Schools. Uh, the first change was about the handlers, and then the second change was about adding that it is reviewed every year as opposed to every six months. Does anybody have any questions on it? I did have one. And, um, Mr. Swanson, I don't know if you can answer, or um, Dr. Adams, but it, and it had come up in a conversation today about the financial responsibility. Do we have a rough idea of how much, what the cost is, the care and literal feeding of the dog for a year? You have to come up. Um, sorry. <laughs> they can hear you. Just it had come up in the context of fundraising, because I think there was a fundraiser coming up with people like, oh, I didn't know I didn't know they were fundraising, so I just wanted to work for others' edification. Right. I would have a hard time giving you a concrete number okay. for cost. I, I would say it's, it's a significant cost because it would include food, medical care, uh, vaccinations, yep. the, the, that sort of thing. I'm not a dog owner myself, so I, I, I wouldn't be able to draw my own experience to comment on exactly how much those visits to the vet cost. Okay. <laughs> I, I know it's a lot, right? Yeah. So, um, a couple thousand a year. Yeah. Okay. I, I will add that just in the agreement, it, it does state that the school department does not assume any financial responsibility. Yes, that's what I wanted to clarify for people, that this is not an expense the school is covering exactly, that this is the response, not the school's responsibility. So I do, that's what I was, that's why I was sort of making the point. Correct, that, yes. right. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So, Can you share, there's a, 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 a network of um, nonprofit organizations that across the state um, that are trying to fundraise. So when you see fundraising, it's to fundraise. Um, Opry is part of that network, the member of, the bigger umbrella is therapy dogs, and he's a smaller component. He's not a therapy dog. He's a comfort dog. Um, and there is a broad um, network across the state, and I, I would imagine across the nation, raising funds to support um, and make sure that the animals are well taken care of. So when folks see that kind of fundraising, it's for those sorts of organizations, of which Opry, um, I would imagine the HPD is advocating or using that um, as a resource to, mm -hmm. through grants mm -hmm. from those organizations to help fund and support um, Opry's care. Right. To this point, Opry's, the, all the expenses for Opry's training and medical care have been funded through a grant that came from the DA's office initially. That was a finite amount, and, and I know, it is, you know it's, it's running out. There's still some money left in that account, but going forward, the expectation is that the cost would be provided through the Hingham Working Dog Foundation, which is a relatively recently established foundation. And um, its mission will be to, to support not only Opry, but other uh, working dogs as well, therapy dogs, comfort dogs. Um, there, there is no Opry Foundation <laughs> per se, but um, I think Opry was a big part of the, the genesis of the Hingham Working Dog Foundation, but its mission will extend certainly beyond just Opry. Thank you. Sure. Did you put questions on? Um, all right. Um, any questions on this? All right. Just add. Uh -huh. Point out. I remember the a year ago the like eleven thirty at night conversation about the therapy dog. Comfort all, dog. Right. But ago. all of the, it was two years ago. <laughs> that would have been a much shorter conversation if it was a comfort dog then. Oh right. Because right. <laughs> I think that looking back, the concerns that people on the, who were on the committee then really were about the categorization of therapy dog. And so I just want to 
I don't know, that just light bulb went on over my head that like, <laughs> that was something that changed with Opry, which I think was unifying. Yeah, no, great addition. Mm-hmm. Great to that that was two years ago. I know. Two years ago. <laughs> All right, okay. Do you like to make a motion? Yeah. I'll make a motion to oh. approve the amendments to the memorandum of understanding between Hingham Public Schools and the Hingham Police Department relating to comfort animals in Hingham Public School. I will second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed or abstaining? Oh, great. Excellent. All right. The MOU is in place. Um, All right, uh, item 7.6 is to complete a second read of the homeschooling policy and act as appropriate. Jen, do you want to take us through this? Sure. Um, I just want to point out that during our last meeting, we had discussed the changes to the first paragraph. So I put them in there in red on the first first paragraph. The second other two items that are in red, those were um, the other suggestions. we did think there was one other typo. Let's see. Um, so we added the mess. School committee to either determine or designate the superintendent that a homeschooling program meets the minimum standards. Okay. So right. that was what we so came up with. But there's, I think there's a, we're missing a word there. Yeah, that the superintendent designate, designate that a homeschooling program. We're missing another designate in there. I think. In the first paragraph? In the yes. First paragraph. To, to either determine or designate the superintendent. Designates. Either or determine to or. Approve. Oh, yeah. Designate the superintendent to determine that a homeschooling program meet the minimum. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so to, to determine after superintendent. To determine. To designate the superintendent to, to determine, determine that a homeschooling yeah. mm-hmm. program. I think the do, do, to determine is in the wrong place. Yes. Good to job. either <laughs> designate the superintendent to determine that a homeschooling program meets the minimum requirements. So once again, <laughs> the school committee to either well, that's what designate I, yep. the superintendent to determine. Well, I no. no, no, no. I think it's I think it's okay the way it is. Okay. Yeah. If you add to determine or designate the superintendent to determine, because MGL says either the school yes. committee yes. can mm-hmm. designate, or we can designate we can determine, or we can designate you to determine. Right. So either we can determine or designate okay. the superintendent to determine, and now that's MGL, and now we are saying we do delegate the authority yeah. to you. Yes. The we're adding yes. determine, determine after determine. the determine. superintendent. Yes. 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 We also, in the last paragraph, I'm cross out that, yeah. that line. Yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, what? Oh, yeah, so, for, yeah, for with. With. Yeah. With, with does not need to be crossed out. Right. So it will say home educated students with, with approved educational programs. Yes. Mm-hmm. Anything else on that? All right. No, and I'll make those corrections and send everyone a fresh copy. Okay. All in black. All right. <laughs> are people, so you have are people comfortable voting on it with the mm-hmm. edits we just made? Okay. All right. I will make a motion to approve the amendments of the homeschooling policy. Um, IHBG. I will second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstaining? No. Great. Great. That is approved as well. Um, all right. 7.7. I'm excited for this. Uh, to review a request for Medco expansion. Oh, did I, did I just show my hand on what I want to do? Uh, to review a request for Medco expansion and act as appropriate. Are you taking that? Question? Yes. Right. So the following is um, to request a proposed expansion of the Medco program student enrollment for the following school year, 2023-24. The proposal is to expand from 50 students to 80 students. It's an additional 30 students. Um, We submitted an expansion plan because it was due on January 16th. Um, I included that um, information. The plan requires the approval of the Hingham School Committee. Please note that the 
the expansion is dependent on the final state budget, the FY24 budget. Um, if we do not reach the 80 um, um, number, we have to um, return any of those funds um, that we do receive or not draw them down. Um, we, um, it's a reminder, I know we're talking about budget, that the MEDCO program is funded through an extensive um, MEDCO grant that provides for all of the cost of transportation as well as some additional costs that offset some personnel um, costs as well. So it pro provides a, a, some revenue to the district um, in addition to the goals around expanding and supporting our students' opportunities um, for um, to interact and support. It's like a dual integration. Our MEDCO students benefit from the opportunity to come to the Hingham schools as well as our Hingham school students benefit from the opportunities to interact with our Boston students as well as our families. Um, as well as an opportunity in places where we see, um, where we have space, um, we're able to absorb those students using um, existing resources. So um, we feel it's a good way to expand the program and provide some additional resources. Does not require any more transportation. We have room on the buses, as we indicated um, in, the, in the plan to the Department of Ed. Um, so we think it makes um, some good sense, both for our goals around diversity and equity and also um, goals around um, providing um, some way to increase our enrollment. Tim? I think this is awesome. Uh, I think uh, <clears throat> the METCO program is something that has strengthened Hingham in so many ways, uh, providing not just racial diversity, but diversity of experience, uh, more economic diversity, although MECO students are not necessarily low income. Um, I think it, we are so much of a stronger school district because we have METCO here. And I think it's really like a jewel in the crown of Hingham schools and, and fully support expanding it is, it's awesome. Yeah. Yay. It reminds me, the 1967 was the first year Hingham had a um, METCO program, METCO students. So the longstanding METCO district wow. um, in the state. So something to be proud of. Matt? Uh, so fully support METCO as well. My question is, my only concern is if we do not have an override, we know we're going to have significantly less teachers. And I know this is only 30, potentially 30 people, but um, I don't know, how do, how do we think about that? You know, any concern about that? And we're already gonna be struggling significantly to teach existing students. You got 30 more who deserve a grade. So I, I don't know, what are, what are our thoughts on that? Well, can I so, add to that to, for you to answer? Maybe you could um, just give a estimate how many students of those 30, because they would be spread out amongst the six schools, so it wouldn't be yep. 30 in the high school or 30 in the middle school. Yep, so we would take students only in grade levels where we have space. So there's a there has to be also a match. We have to have space in those particular grade levels, and we have to have a medical families interested at that particular grade. So there's kind of a two side to it. So we're saying we're gonna expand to 80, but we also have to make sure that those two things are in alignment, right? So um, we can absorb the students um, easily into our middle and high school, given our current numbers and existing structures. We're not saying we're gonna take 30 students in sixth grade, so we expand them out, probably some in sixth, some in eighth, some in ninth. I think ninth and 10th is where the kind of like the sweet spot not taking a student in 11th and 12th grade. I think we'd prefer at sort of those transition points. Um, plenty of room on the bus, doesn't need any additional resources. And the grant is larger um, in order to absorb any additional costs that we might have in order to both support the students um, and support any costs that we have. And our students benefit both from having the students and, and, and uh, also from those additional resources as well. So. We see it as a win in the sense that we are also increasing our enrollment as well as having additional resources to support that. So it would be done at transition points. We would have space to absorb the students and it wouldn't be like we'd have 30 students in sixth grade. It's sort of spread out 
but again, has to align with parent interests on METCO parents being interested in Hingham, as well as the particular grade levels that we have space. And by, if that's helpful, um, if we don't, if we have to go to the balanced budget, like we don't know, one, we haven't even talked about what the 1.1 to 4.8 looks like. We're gonna talk about that on Thursday. It's gonna be you know, very diff a very difficult discussion. Um, and then we won't know for sure until April, whatever, 30th. And then even then, you know, proposals that are being put forth right now aren't necessarily final. Do we have, um, is there a scenario that if that happened that we, we would say, ooh, maybe this isn't the right year to do it? Or is it sort of, it's past the point? Um, enrollment starts in March, so the pro it's a long process. It starts in March and goes all the way through June. Um, so I would say, given that our current enrollment where we are, we could definitely absorb the students with the balanced and reduced budget. Remember, these students come with additional funding, which allows us to offset potentially some of the cuts in the balanced and reduced services budget. The amount of money is always dependent on um, the state um, and what they allot for METCO. Um, so it's unclear year to year, but we have a, a healthy grant that allows us to sustain the program. So what, so. so we're talking <coughs> a little bit more. So if we add an additional 30, like what's, a, what on average, I may hate, this is the wrong way to think about it, like reducing these, you know, kids to what is the dollar amount associated with it? But I do think in this, this, you know, bad scenario of $4.8 million. Like, so what is the additional per pupil grant? Uh, for Medco, I don't know off the top of my head. Sorry. Yeah. I don't yeah. think so. Like, is there, I guess from where I'm going is, is I, there a scenario that by doing this, you actually can save, you know, not have to eliminate two teachers or one I teacher? Wouldn't, or I wouldn't say that. It help, does help offset some the cost cost of personnel teachers. costs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so some of the grant is applied to teaching. Teaching. Yeah. And prize. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And it is in the um, eleven to thirteen thousand dollar range per mm -hmm. student. And what we end up seeing, you can see, um, the operating budget is reduced, it, because it's we're we're absorbing um, some of that MECO grant to teachers and utilities and things like that. So it actually helps our operating budget. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I think the amount varies by year. It varies, depending yeah. on the state allocation for MECO, which has increased um, over the last few years. Mm -hmm. Yes. This allows us to go up to 80, doesn't mean we'll reach it because right. we, those we two things right have now, to right align. Now, 50, like um, right currently, right now we have 45. Um, so things like, there are several things that have to sort of align as we move through the process. And we have to be approved by the state in order to expand. Yeah, and, yes. and just to add, I, in the past, um, we couldn't expand because we didn't have the transportation. We were um, partnering with Cohasset, I think, where we were bringing MECO students to Cohasset. Um, but now we've got the we've actually got the space, so we can enhance the program. And I think um, we're really fortunate to be able to get it. And I, I, I want to stress this because it has come up recently um, that we do get state funding per student that comes here. We're not funding this. The taxpayers are not funding these students to come here. Um, so I think that's important. But I also the the biggest piece of this and the the reason why it's um, it's a program that is so important is we are a racially segregated community and there have been plenty of studies that show that um, corporations that reflect the United States or reflect the the country that they're in um, are more successful and we don't currently have a population that reflects the United States or the state um, so I think it's really important to um, to have these students here and make sure that they're successful um, which in, would include all the things that we talked about in the fall um, trying to do host families and getting them um, included in the community and doing like sporting activities or what have you so whatever we can do to help that uh, move along would be great too Any other questions on it? All right. No, none online. None online. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm. Um, this is something we've been talking about for a while, and given the fact that it is funded um, with the state grant, and that it is not a 
strain on school resources and the fact that we have the capacity. The not we. It's sort of all the stars are aligning, right? We have the transportation now. We have the um, room to include the students. So it feels like a great time to do it. Um, so. All right, Barbie Lynch has a question. Oh, all right. Um, Barbie? Barbie, we're going to unmute you in one second. I just asked her to, there we go. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, now we can. How are you? Hi, uh, Barbie Lynch, 3 West Moreland Road. I had a question. Um, I'm just curious on uh, the why of we have so much room, that we have room to take on more students. And then the second part of the question is, what happens when those numbers go back up? Sure. Um, do you want to? Sure, we've presented um, to the school committee um, numbers at our middle school and high school where our numbers are declining. Um, so we've just seen school, and some of that is due to the pandemic, um, and we're hoping those numbers go up. Um, we can always um, adapt our um, METCO number, but I think that over time, that at a comprehensive, especially at our middle school and high school, at a comprehensive middle school and high school, we can absorb um, the students um, using our what we have currently available um, as staffing um, and something to think about as we move forward if we want to change our number. I think the value, as others have said tonight, of having um, diverse students for our own students is something we should um, celebrate and honor. And um, I think the opportunity is a great one, remembering that the resources also are accompanying the students and our students benefit from that additional financial resource by having um, those resources, both the, the opportunity to interact with other students and as well as the opportunity to have those financial resources that accompany those students. I just, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't think I got the full answer on the reason why we have the numbers that are so low. I'm just curious only because my, my concern would be, and, and I, I think it's um, an opportunity that great for our other students, but I, my first thought would be the students that live in our current town, that what happens when people do come back, or is that the plan to hope get, to hope get people's families back in? And like the actual why we don't have the numbers any longer, not just because of the pandemic, but like the actual reason. Well, I think the actual reason is, as we've seen, a across the country is that enrollment in public schools has declined anywhere from 10 to 20 percent, depending on the districts. Um, and once people have pulled their children out to go to a private school or to homeschool, depending on sort of what years they're in, they're less likely to potentially bring their children back, right? If you have pulled your child out in first grade to go to private school, you're likely going to keep them there until maybe the next transition phase, which would be into the middle school. Same if you'd pulled them out of middle, you might wait until high school. So we do expect and certainly desire for those families who've decided to either homeschool or um, send students to private school to return to the Hingham Public Schools. But there's really the, the only driver, as far as we can understand, is um, just based on national and state statistics, is that this was driven by the pandemic um, and folks choosing to send their students to private school or to homeschool. So it is the expectation that we will have students come back. And as Dr. Adams pointed out, even, even if all the students came back, we still would have room for um, these additional METCO students. And every year there's a collaboration between the METCO office, the METCO director, and the superintendent to look at school enrollment and say, we think we have four seats in first grade. We have two seats here. We have one seat here. Um, and we, make, we look at current enrollment and make a decision on where we feel we can best absorb students um, without having an impact um, on other resources. So that happens every year. So um, Ms. Jackson and I will sit and say, we can take five students in ninth grade, we can take five students in sixth grade, and four students in first grade. And we do that on an ongoing basis um, every year. Um, I would just like to, to say one more thing. I, I think it's really important I mean, I've spoken to a few of the board members um, individually. I have a child who's in private school, and next year I'll have both my children in private school. And I've spoken to them individually, um, people on the board, as the reason why I'm doing the public schools. I do think it's really important um, as 
that I care about this town and I care about the students uh, that live in this town that I think we should really dig a little deeper into the reasons of why people are leaving to go to private schools and what the school board itself can maybe do to try to retain people um, because the mass exodus is kind of bad to see the public schools um, and I see it as a substitute teacher in the school system as well I think it's really important. I would agree. I, I, I would disagree with the, uh, the term that it's a mass exodus. I mean, it's it, it hasn't been a mass exodus. And we do think that enhancing the METCO program is another selling point for people to come back to the Hingham Public Schools, that this is, it makes the district unique. It brings some well-needed um, diversity to our students. It, in, it opens up worlds that and opportunities for students both in Boston and here. So I think, I mean, I personally, as a board member, believe that this is another selling point for the Hingham Public Schools and another reason to return your kids to the to the public schools. I, I would agree with that. I've talked to a number of friends who made that decision during the pandemic to pull them in. One thing they really like about the private schools is the diversity. Mm -hmm. You know, they're they're they don't it doesn't look like us. So right. mm -hmm. I would agree with that. Yeah. But your point is well taken, Barbie, in that um, that we do want to, you know, do some more surveys. And I think um, that's something that is planned to start surveying families to find out why are you going to private schools? Are you thinking about coming back? What would you know, what were your reasons for leaving? What would your reasons be for coming back? So we are we do have plans to do that. So that point is well taken. Can you just go up there? Sorry. Oh. <laughs> just so we can show you on the camera. Thank you. I might not have asked the question. If <laughs> Sorry. So with the METCO program, I, I mean, I'm loosely familiar with it, but is it uh, a program where once a match is made, it's an annual re-up every year, or does the student get a pathway to graduation? And if so, um, you know, is it a formal commitment or kind of a, a loose commitment where you've got flexibility? And then what what's the retention like? Do the students choose to come back year over year and they're, you know, happy to stay through till graduation or what do those numbers look like? That's a great question. Can you? Yeah, I, I, it, once you make a commitment to a student, you're committing till 12th grade. Great. Um, and majority of students do stay sometimes at transition points because there's some opportunities um, in Boston sort of um, with exam schools, you might see some attrition. Um, students like, like going into ninth grade or going into seventh grade have some additional opportunities in Boston, and they might go off to some other opportunity that's available to them. But mostly they, when they make a commitment, they, they do end up staying unless there's some other opportunity they, they found. Great, thanks. Thank you. Anything else? All right, folks ready to? Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the expansion of the METCO program by an additional 30 students. I will second. All right. Any further discussion or questions? No? All right. We'll vote then. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstain? Okay, great. That is unanimously approved. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Dr. Thank Adams you. and Doc and um, Ms. Jackson for putting this together and um, applying to the state. So we'll wait to hear back if our application is approved. All right, um, item eight, our subcommittee and project reports. I, um, it'll be 48 hours. Actually, let me get there, okay. Um, subcommittee reports, do you have anything, Matt? Yeah, East uh, School Council met last week. I was not able to attend, but I did get an update from uh, Principal House. So uh, he called out three things that they discussed. Uh, first was budget impacts and impending redu reductions um, and what he realized I guess or they realized was um, both the parent and community representative really didn't have any awareness of um, the fact that this was coming or potentially coming over I vote and so it led to a kind of a longer discussion around you know what more can they be doing at the school level and you know probably for us to think about what more can we be doing to make sure people are fully aware of um, you know, what's, what's gonna happen in the next couple of months. So uh, that was one piece. Uh, the second piece was they had a uh, emergency response drill stay in place and sounds like there was some feedback from parents just 
um, trying to understand, you know, kind of why they were doing it. And so uh, the important thing that he, uh, they all talked about was just being very clear to children and parents around, you know, why, why do we do this and make sure we're doing it in an age appropriate way. You have very different, you know, levels, but so, you know, good, good uh, learning, I guess. Uh, and the final thing they talked about uh, East efforts in the DEI space. Um, they've been, East has been embedding DEI monthly themes. Um, and this month was Lunar New Year. And so they had uh, distributed that to all the faculty and are encouraging them to have a discussion in, in each of their classrooms around that. So that's all I have. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Allie. Yes, um, PRS is having their school council meeting tomorrow, so I will attend and report back. And then Hingham Arts Alliance is having a fundraiser at the community center on March 11th, 7 o'clock. Should be a great night. They're going to have some groups performing there um, from within the community. There'll be some auction items, music, all kinds of fun stuff. So I'm happy to share the link for anyone who wants tickets. And then finally, the Climate Action Planning Committee is planning to come. They have a meeting on Thursday night, and then they are planning to come to present to us, and Michelle, I'll confirm with you if they can be here the 13th. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. uh, the, on February 9th at uh, 7 o'clock uh, via Zoom, it will be a remote meeting, but we'll have a meeting for the special ed subcommittee. Um, can Carrie? I ask oh. office hours? When is hmm? the next office hours? February 6th. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the <laughs> Hingham Middle School Council will meet next Monday, January 30th, and I'll attend and report back. Um, salary negotiations, we're continuing to discuss a successor contract with Unit B, which is our paraprofessionals. We have a number of dates on the calendar for that. And we will be meeting on February 15th. We re received a request to begin negotiations with Unit A, which is our teacher. So we'll be meeting on the 15th to kind of organize ourselves for that. All right, great. Jen? Um, the next South School Council is meeting this Wednesday, so I'll, I will attend that. Um, and I also will be attending their um, the PTO's March um, meeting. Um, I know that Dr. Adams has been out to some of the elementary schools to kind of um, talk about the budget. Um, and I was just hoping to make myself available if they have questions at their PTO meetings for that. So I scheduled that. And then I attended the SNAP uh, meeting on January January 10th, and their next meeting is February, the Tuesday, the first Tuesday yeah. of February. Um, they have their Pizza Palooza is coming back um, after four years, so they're very excited yeah. to be having that again. It's going to be on March 29th, and then they're having their 10th anniversary celebration. They've been 10 years, which I think is amazing, um, and that is going to be on May 18th, and they're continuing to have their sports programs throughout the so this season they're doing learn to skate zumba yoga and basketball thank you um i have a few we i had reported before that um the finance subcommittee met with capital um katie sinclair and dr adams and aisha pong had taken us through what the capital requests are i'm going to have the draft minutes put into our shared um, finance minutes so that you can see that before our joint meeting next week. Um, so just wanted to make you aware of that. Uh, Foster School Council will be meeting on January 31st, and Dr. Adams is gonna be attending the PTO meeting on February 2nd, and the Sustainable Budget Task Force met on Thursday. Okay, great. Um, I missed the high school council meeting on the 18th. Um, I was otherwise engaged at another meeting, and I. Unfortunately, I think I might mix the next one on February 15th for the same reason, but um, but um, our fabulous secretary puts together great minutes, so I can give you some updates from that. Um, uh, the Metco director, Amy Jackson, joined um, Mr. Swanson and the team to preview second annual Unity Week that um, Nathan mentioned earlier. There were some um, grants that were given to support the Unity Week, um, so that is some exciting stuff. They're doing, um, working on a lot of things with local vendors to maybe um, get some donations for local restaurants and whatnot. Um, Mr. Swanson provided a budget update to the council um, and there was discussion about environmental stewardship, which is a longstanding part of the school improvement goals. Um, 
Um, and there are some things that came up um, to consider are using compostable trays in the cafeteria um, slash the trash is still going on. This has been a particularly good one, it sounds like. Um, and starting to think about recruiting some of the clubs too to participate in it, not just the sports teams. Um, and um, I guess, um, and then the next meeting is on February 15th. So I don't think I'm gonna miss that one too because we have salary negotiations. Um, and really, I feel like that's all I have, but I feel like I've done nothing but attend meetings for the last <laughs> 60 days. But yeah, that's all I seem to have for my project reports. Um, all right. Um, we, number nine is other items not reasonably known 48 hours in advance. And tonight, we do actually have one. Um, it is in your packet. I don't know if everyone um, had a chance to see it. I do not know where it went. It was on my screen. Um, but I will let Dr. Adams explain this item. So you have a memo from Aisha, um, and she can add, um, but it clearly says that the South Elementary School, while we've made some updates to it for ADA compliance, um, currently there are students um, who um, cannot access parts of the playground equipment with their classmates for their grade level. So you can imagine as they move up in the grade levels, they have access to more parts of the equipment. Um, and so students who have walkers and or wheelchairs can't access. And we have current students who cannot access the playground. Um, so we are asking for um, you to approve tonight um, an application for us to go to the town emergency funds to um, ask for the amount of approximately $45,000 um, to update that playground so those students could have immediate access um, to the playground, um, those who have current mobility um, challenges. So what it actually entails is putting down some matting, which you might have seen in some other schools that allows it to be fully accessible, um, particularly to these current students. So if you wanna add anything else. I would just add that this is um, unusual. We don't usually um, go to the town for funding, uh, particularly because we do have our own facilities revolving account, but those funds <laughs> are already um, spoken for because we have two other sort of emergency um, repairs that need to be done this year. One, the elevator at the high school needed to be repaired, and then um, the roof at the high school needs some shoring up as well. So those are going to almost exhaust the funds we have available in the revolving. Yeah, not quite, not, not quite. quite. It'll so be, oh, do you want to share? Some, yes. some balance, which of course we want to keep because we don't want to spend that down entirely. Right, so in terms of, um, of, of that revol revolving account, part of our budget for this year require, well, require, well, requires that we spend 60,000 out of, out, of out of the revolving account for this year and we're proposing 55,000 for next year. Okay. In addition to that, we have 125,000 elevator repair that we've had to, um, which we had to fix just because of um, requirements that we had to fulfill. Mm -hmm. um, so I, our, our fear is that we're actually depleting that account. Mm -hmm. And although we have other re revolving accounts, there isn't another revolving account that we have that directly um, fits the bill of uh, where we can actually deduct money from for, for, for repairs as it relates to the facilities. So for example, we have full day kindergarten revolving, but we can't use full day kindergarten funds mm -hmm. to repair anything that we need repaired. Um, so that is why we're looking to see if the town can help us in, as part of the emergency reserve fund mm -hmm. and to help with that those repairs as well. Is the mulch that rubber mulch? The, so yeah, so it'll be like it'll be mulch, and then there's like there's like a mat yeah. that is placed on top of the mulch. I was just, I was just looking. Eight thousand seems like a lot for regular mulch. Right. So it's, <laughs> it's like not. A, yeah. So it's the okay. mulch, and and in addition to that, there'll be the carpeting. Of, and it's a wide area. I don't know. If, I'm sure you probably have you seen the like the south playground. It gets you all the way to the the swings. Yeah. So it's a wide area as well. Okay. Yeah. Um. Any other questions or? Comments? So this, um, so what we would be taking action on is just to give approval to go to the select board and then advisory committee because they both have to approve um, the transfer. So this is really just giving the committees okay to 
Dr. Adams and Aisha and the committee to go in front of them and request that. And I think we are on the agenda for select board next next, next Tuesday. And then ADCOM would be um, I think that Thursday. Yeah. Can I ask if there's, so we have basically three needs right now, emergency needs right now. Why, what was the thinking behind going to the town with this one of those three as opposed to the other two? We're not quite ready for the yes. other one, okay. so we're working on some right. testing and some quotes to okay. be the ready for the cost. Right, and right. And I think the elevator we'd already sort of planned to absorb okay. through the yeah. revolving fund, and then the um, roof repair at the high school is still TBD. Being evaluated, yes. Okay. Right, but we do know that with the roof, the roof that they they definitely will be expenses. Whether we bring it to emergency or whether we bring it to the capital account, it will be brought to the town, just because it's testing being done and evaluated. We know that the roof is actually leaking, parts of it are leaking anyhow, mm -hmm. and we know that. But then we still need to see like how far is has it gone through in terms of the actual insulation and everything mm -hmm. else. I think the impetus too for this need is that there are current students who just cannot access with their grade level peers um, the spaces. And so we, we knew the cost and we knew that this immediately, this was something that was planned for capital, but we really didn't feel like we should be waiting a full year to be giving access to the students who can't access the playground at this point. That makes sense. Uh, yes, I would wholeheartedly agree. I can't wait. Mm -hmm. um, so will this cover the playground matting for that we had planned for FY24? Is, will that be covered in that? So that's just at South. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. There's there's some additional need at East as well too, where the, we were actually looking at um, adding some play equipment, mm -hmm. um, so that the, the the student or students at East actually have some additional whether it be tic tac toe or others that they can reach. On the, so we'd be adding some equipment to that one at East. Um, but for the South one, the kid isn't even able to like meet his peers at all. So it's, I mean, we do have some matting there, um, but it just isn't as extensive as we would like in terms of even him the ability or her the ability to be with their, their peers. Absolutely. Yeah. I was just thinking, I was just trying to, in my mind, right. move that from, we're essentially moving some of that from FY24 to 23. Yeah. To possibly be replaced by a roof, um, portion of a yes. roof yes. <laughs> right. Right. that so. is leaking at the moment. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the dollar amount won't go away. <laughs> It'll just be so the category that it's being spent in. Yes. But along those lines, um, when we meet with capital outlay next week, will we know exactly which ones are coming out of the what you had already presented and what needs to be added in, or are we not ready so for the roof? So in terms of the roof itself. Um, the last on Friday, we, Katie and I spoke, and there, there was somebody actually going on the roof to like cut a circle into it and see the extent of the leakage and everything else. I don't know if the weather has the fact mm -hmm. that we've had snow the last day or two, and then and on Friday was it raining on Friday as well? I don't remember now, but um, but we we're working <laughs> towards trying to see if we can get that information into capital as well because that'll be very important. Yes, right. That'll be very important. And I have seen that leak when I was going to a right. game, so. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. All right. All right. Um, I'll make a motion. Make a motion. Right. Um, to provide approval for the upgrade to the South Elementary School playground to be updated through an application of town emergency funds to ensure immediate access of the full playground to our current students with mobility challenges. I will second. Any further discussion? No. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed or abstain? All right, that is approved as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's great. All right, so we'll keep you posted on what the select board and advisory say. So thank you. Um, all right, um, if there's nothing else under 48 hours, I would accept a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. I will second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, we are adjourned. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks.